Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Welcome to the Catholic Mama, where you'll learn how to deepen and defend your faith, find comfort as we share the vocation of parenthood, and learn how to raise your children confidently Catholic. I'm your host, Christine Mooney Flynn. Let's get started. And welcome back to The Catholic Mama. I'm your host, Christine Mooney Flynn, and thank you for joining me on this episode where we look at women and their roles in the Catholic Church. So we've been out and about, my husband and I and our kids, traveling through um, the Midwest, visiting family, and many of the people that we are talking to are old friends, family members who knew us for sure before my husband and I converted or reconverted, as my husband's case, to Catholicism. And they are quite intrigued about why we would decide to do that. We hear this actually a lot from cradle Catholics. There's been very, very interested to hear why someone who was outside of the church would choose to come into it, especially uh, in recent months with the the terrible scandals and clerical abuse uh, cover-ups that we've been hearing about. Um, So one of the questions that came up was, well, what do you think? to me. I said, Christine, what do you think? Should women, very simple, and it it doesn't take a lot for me to talk about. I'm not going to beat around the bush. No, I I don't think women should be priests. I think this boils down to um, a question, instead of asking questions like this, you know, should women become priests, which is, you know, that's a valid question. Asking questions about this, getting to the answers is, is great. It has to be done. I think looking back and trying to answer this in a way um, that comes to oh, my computer made a noise. Um, I think in order to answer questions like this, there it, it falls into a bucket of one of three questions. And my husband likes to talk about this as kind of a minimum apologetic. If you can answer these three questions in the affirmative, then really you have no choice almost of course you have a choice but it's the most common or the most sensical thing to do would be to become catholic if you weren't already so i think it works well for these questions such as these more it works well for these questions such as these more modern or um well i don't know questions like this have been happening for ages but um these more um more more tactical rather than very very specific questions rather than just broad questions about the catholic church so the three questions, and this works well as an evangelizing tool anyway. One, does God exist? Two, is Jesus Christ, Christ God? That is, is he who he says he is? And three, did Jesus found the Catholic Church? If you can answer uh, and find reasons to answer that, yes, there is a God. And yes, Christ is who he says he is and he is God. And yes, he did start the Catholic Church and found the Catholic Church. Then that kind of answers the question right there. Should women be allowed to be priests? Because Christ uh, did not choose women to be part of his, uh, choose women to be part of his uh, apostolate at the beginning. Uh, You can argue and say that, um, well, you know, just women weren't um, able to have those kinds of positions at the time. If that was the case, um, then, well, then God isn't really who he says he is. If God really wanted to come in and change everything, which he certainly did by dying on that cross, he could have very easily made women into to priests at that moment. Uh, but he didn't. God can do anything, but he didn't do that. What did he do? Uh, he healed a lot of people. He revealed himself and healed a lot of women. Uh, from the very beginning, the first human that knows of Jesus is Mary. The second human to know about Jesus is Elizabeth. The first person that Jesus comes to um, afterwards is Mary Magdalene, after his resurrection. The first people to discover of the Catholic Church, not at the very beginning and certainly not now. Um, So I think that if you can answer that question of who is is Jesus exactly who he says he is? And we have to look at what he did while he was alive on earth and what kind of precedent he set. He gave St. Peter the keys to the kingdom. He built the, the rock, the church, his physical earthly church, his mystical body, 
on earth through Peter and his apostles. Um, but he also revealed himself in a lot of beautiful, more nuanced, uh, really wonderful, intimate ways to women. And it's not very often in in scripture that we see that the women are giving Jesus a hard time. It almost seems like the women that we see in these stories are much more um, obedient to God's will, submissive to it. And I mean this in a very good way. Submission is a hard word for women to, I think, joyfully grasp. Um, grasp. Um, but if it's submission to God, it's different. Um, they are much more willing to hear Jesus. They're not selling, saying maybe silly things like Peter at the transfiguration, trying to invite uh, Moses and Elijah and Jesus to build some huts up on a mountaintop. Um, they don't deny Christ in front of others uh, when he gets arrested. Um, they don't express doubt as far as we know that Jesus is able to feed thousands of people with just a few loaves of bread. The women in our Bible stories um, in the New Testament, the gospel, are really showing their complete understanding or submission to Jesus and his will. Um, now, that doesn't mean that they don't get a little snippy. Uh, Martha certainly did because she was doing a lot of work and Mary, her sister, wasn't. Um, or being upset that the brother Lazarus died. And if Jesus had been there, that wouldn't have happened. So they're not totally quiet um, and don't always get exactly their way. And they do get chastised by Jesus because certainly they're not perfect. But the women that we see in the New Testament have a much uh, more nuanced, richer relationship with Jesus than I think uh, anyone who's throwing a fit and <laughs> pitching a fit that women can't be ordained as priests are missing. So I'm reading currently um, Fulton Sheen's The World's First Love. It's about Mary. And in chapter six, and I alluded to this on my Instagram the other day because there was just a quote in here that just completely stunned me and I thought it was breathtaking. But I think, you know, half of this chapter is worth reading. It's a, it's a very short chapter. But in case you've never read this, I'm just, I, I want to take a few minutes and read a couple pages to you. And then we'll keep going and talk a little bit more about uh, women's roles in the Catholic Church. Now, if you aren't unfamiliar with Fulton Sheen, um, there is a cause open for his... Um, uh, for him to become a saint, for him to become a saint. As far as I can tell, that story seems pretty valid to me. And actually on another episode with uh, Katie Bogner, we talked a little bit about that story. So uh, I will link that in the show notes if you want to go back and listen to that episode. It was just a few episodes ago. It was really, really impressive and beautiful. Everything that I've heard of Fulton Sheen has made me respect him so, so greatly. And if you have ever watched any of his old episodes. He really was the, the first original televangelist before they got bad names. He just had a, a regal, loving, funny, uh, strong, commanding presence. He was, he was a very, very smart man, a great philosopher, a wonderful writer, and really someone to look up to. And, um, and really, if you need a spiritual father, you might, you might want to consider him. So this is from uh, page 86 the world's first love. It's a chapter, chapter six, titled The Virgin Mother. One of the most beautiful lessons in the world, lessons in the world, emergence from the Annunciation, namely the vocation of woman to supreme religious values. Mary is here recapturing woman's vocation from the beginning, namely to be, hu to, be to humanity the bearer of the divine. Every mother is this when she gives birth to a child, for the soul of every child is infused by God. She thus becomes a co-worker with divinity. She bears what God alone can give. As the priest in the order of redemption at the moment of consecration brings the crucified savior to the altar, so the mother in the order of creation brings the spirit that issues from the hand of God to the cradle of earth. With such thoughts in mind, Leon Bloy once said, the more a woman is holy, the more she becomes a woman. Why? It is not that women are naturally more religious than men, this statement is merely a rationalization made by men who have fallen from their ideals. Man and woman each have a specific mission under God to complement one, an complement one another. Each too has its symbol in the lower order. Man may be likened to the animal in his acquisitiveness, mobility, and initiative. Woman may be likened to the flower, which is fixed between heaven and earth. She is like the earth in her bearing of life. She is like heaven in her aspirations to blossom upward to the divine. The mark of man is initiative, but the mark of woman is cooperation. 
Man talks about freedom, woman about sympathy, love, sacrifice. Man cooperates with nature, woman cooperates with God. Man was called to till the earth, to, quote, rule over the earth. Woman to be the bearer of a life that comes from God. The hidden wish of every woman in history, the secret desire of every feminine heart, is fulfilled in that instant when Mary says, Fiat, be it done unto me according to thy word. Here is cooperation at its best. Here is the essence of womanhood, acceptance, resignation, submission. Be it done unto, done unto me. Whether it be the unmarried daughter who cares for the mother with her fiat of surrender to service, or the wife who accepts the husband in the unity of the flesh, or the saint who accepts the little crosses proffered by her Savior, or this unique woman whose soul submits to the divine mystery of mothering God made man, there is present in varying degrees the beautiful picture of woman in her sublimest vocation, making the total gift, accepting a divine assignment, being submissive for heaven's holy purposes. Mary calls herself the handmaid of the Lord, not to be this for any woman lowers her dignity. Woman's unhappiest moments are when she is unable to give. Her most hellish moments are when she refuses to give. Tragedy stalks when woman is forced by economic or social circumstances to busy herself in those materialities that hamper or dam up the outpouring pouring of that specific quality of surrender to divine purpose that makes her a woman. Deni denied an outlet for the bursting need of giving, she feels a deeper sense of emptiness than a man, precisely because of the greater depths of her fountain of love. For a woman to be the collaborator with the divine, whether it be helping with the missions, visiting the sick after business hours, freely offering services to hospitals, or mothering her children, is to enjoy that equilibrium of spirit which is the essence of sanity. Liturgy speaks of woman as fulfilling the mystery of love. And love does not mean to have, to own, to possess. It means to be had, to be owned, to be possessed. It is the giving of self for another. A woman may love God immediately through creatures, or she may love God immediately, as Mary did. But to be happy, she must bring the divine to the human. The explosive revolt of woman against her alleged inequalities with man is at bottom a protest against the restraints of a bourgeois civilization without faith, one that has chained her God-given talent, God talents. What every woman wants in the, quote, mystery of love is not the bestial burst, but the soul. Man is driven by love of pleasure, woman by the pleasure of love, by its meaning and the enrichment of soul it grants. In this beautiful moment of the Annunciation, woman reaches her sublimest fulfillment for God's sake. As the earth submits to the exigency of the seed for the sake of the harvest, as the nurse submits to the exigencies of the wounded for the sake of the healing, as the wife submits to the exigencies of the flesh for the sake of the child, so Mary submits to the exigencies of the divine will for the sake of the redemption of the world. Closely allied with this submission is sacrifice, for submission is not passivity, but action, the action of self-forgetfulness. Woman is capable of greater sacrifices than man, partly because her love is less inter intermittent, and also because she is unhappy without total and complete dedication. Woman is made for the sacred. She is heaven's instrument on earth. Mary is the prototype, the pattern woman who fulfills in herself the deepest aspirations of the heart of every daughter of Eve. Virginity and maternity are not so irreconcilable as it would seem. Every virgin yearns to become a mother, either physically or spiritually, for unless she creates, mothers, nurses, and fosters life, her heart is as uneasy and awkward as a giant ship in shallow waters. She has the vocation of generating life, either in the flesh or in the spirit through conversion. There is nothing in professional life that necessarily hardens a woman. If such a woman does become hardened, it is because she is denied those specifically creative godlike functions which, without which she cannot be happy. On the other hand, every wife and mother strives for spiritual virginity and that she would like to take back what she has given, that she might offer it all over again, only this time more deeply, more piously, more divinely. There is something incomplete about virginity, something ungiven, unsurrendered, kept back. There is something lost in all there's something lost in all motherhood, something given, something taken, and something irrecoverable. But in the woman, there was realized physical and spiritually what every woman desires physically. In Mary, there was nothing unsurrendered, nothing lost. There was a harvest without the loss of the bud, an autumn and an internal spring, a submission without a spoilation. Virgin and mother. 
the only melody that fell from the violin of God's creation without the breaking of a string. Woman has a mission to give life. The life that is to be born of Mary comes without the spark of love of a human spouse, but with the flame of a love of the Holy Spirit. There can be no birth without love, but the meaning of the virgin birth is divine love acting without benefit of the flesh. As a result, he whom the heavens could not contain, she now contains within herself. This was the beginning of the propagation of the faith in Christ Jesus our Lord, for in her virgin body is celebrated, as in a new Eden, the nuptials of God and man. God and man. Because in this one woman virginity and motherhood are united, it must be that God willed to show how both are necessary for the world. What are separated in other creatures are united in her. The mother is the protectress of the virgin, and the virgin is the inspiration of motherhood. Without mothers, there would be no virgins in the next generation. Without the virgins, mothers would forget the sublime ideal that lies beyond the flesh. They complement one another, like the sun and the rain. Without the sun, there would be no clouds, and without the clouds, there would be no rain. The clouds, like mothers, surrender something in fecundating the earth. But the sun, like the virgin, recoups and recovers that loss by drawing the gentle drops back again into the heavens. How beautiful to think that he who is generated without a mother in heaven is now born without a father on earth. Can we imagine a little bird building the very nest in which it is to be hatched? It is clearly impossible, because the bird would have to exist before it could build its own nest. But that is what happened, in a sense, with God, as the very nest from which he would be born. We have often heard friends and relatives say of a child, oh, you look like your father, or you look like your mother, or you get your blue eyes from your mother's side, or you get your smartness from your father's side. Well, our Lord had no earthly father's side. Where did our Lord get his beautiful face, his strong body, his clean blood, his sensitive mouth, his delicate fingers? He got them from his mother's side. Where did he get his divinity, his divine mind that knows all things, even our most secret thoughts, and his divine power over life and death? He got these from his heavenly father's side. It is a terrible thing for men to not know their father, but it is even more terrible not to know their heavenly mother. And the greatest compliment that can be paid to a true Christian is, you took after your father's side in grace, but in your humanity, you took after your mother's side. So if you stuck through with me as I read all that, I hope you enjoyed it. And I really, again, highly recommend that you go and go and read the world's first love by Fulton Sheen. And even if it is just chapter six, that chapter, when I read it, I put the book down and I, there's a part where I I just wrote breathtaking next to it because it is so hard. I feel for a postmodern woman uh, to hear those words of submission and think that's a positive thing. But when you hear it in the context of how it is truly meant, not in submission to fellow man, but into submission to God's will. Wow, that makes it a little bit different. And it takes the ego out of it just a little bit, or it should. Uh, So the idea that women would need to be priests in order to be part of the church, I think that's looking at it the wrong way. Women are part of the church. We make up a very huge portion of the church. And as I said earlier, the women who were there in the Gospels, there in the Gospels, did some really brave and incredible things. They trusted God. They trusted that, that Jesus is who he said he is. Even St. Veronica, who wipes the sweat off of Jesus' brow on his way to Calvary. These are things that ordinary unbelievers wouldn't be able to do. But the women in the Gospel are brave, and we have the couple thousand years afterwards of many, many female saints who did wonderful things, many unnamed saints who we don't even know of now who saved lives and uh, spread God's truth. If we look at the fact that we can't, that women can't be ordained as priests as a show that the Catholic church is sexist in any way, I think that puts too much pressure on the leaders themselves. And I think that we actually have gotten to this problem in uh, the United States currently anyways, or maybe in the Western world, I should say. We kind of forget that the, we kind of forget that the, the everyday person is really responsible, right? So we keep looking as our, at our leaders, people who get elected, and we either love them or hate them. We want to give them more power, or we want to rise up and take that power away from them. But it's not just about a leader, A leader is very important. It solidifies the whole cause. 
and the whole nation or church. But it isn't the leader that makes the church or the country or the organization. It's the everyday person who does. And rather than blame an authority um, because you don't like something that's happening, maybe it's better to look and see what you can do to change things. Uh, And if it's not, you know, sacrament of holy orders is a sacrament, which means that it can't be changed. Same as the sacrament of matrimony. It's not going to be changed to have another definition of marriage or to have women become priests. And it's not to say that women are lesser than men. It's not to say that we should not be sympathetic towards people, say, with um, homosexual um, attraction. But what that does mean is that these are sacraments that Jesus Christ, God, came here and told us about himself. He created, he established these sacraments. Humans just can't change them. If we tried to change them, then we'd also have to say that Jesus didn't know what he was talking about, that maybe he wasn't God or wasn't as divine and all-knowing as we like to think that he is. So you can't have your cake and eat it too, I think is the right saying for this. You have to pick one uh, one or the other. Is Jesus who he said he is? Is he truly God? Did he really establish the Catholic Church at the very beginning with his male apostles and with the support and the love and the obedience to his own mother and to the women around him? If you can answer yes to that, then we have to sacraments stay just as they are and uh, submitting ourselves not to man's will, but to God's. That said, we have so many saints that we can look to, doctors of the church. We have four female doctors of the church who give varied and wonderful and brave um, examples of how we can live. So this all kind of goes back to the idea that if your big beef, if you're, you're throwing a bone or, you, you know, you're picking a fight because you can't get ordained, I think you're putting too much emphasis on the priests. Yes, it's very, very important. They act in the, the as in God's, uh, in, in Christ's, um, in Christ's name in a lot of these sacraments. But that isn't all that's going on here. We need the laity. We need to be responsible for ourselves. Heaven can start here. Hell can start here. Purgatory can start here. All this starts on earth within ourselves. And if we just try to pick an infight and, and say that women, that the Catholic Church hates women or something because they can't become priests of what women are called to be, what our vocations are. Uh, and it really boils down to everything that Fulton Sheen, Sheen said in that reading that I gave. Um, it, we have a very powerful, important role in cultivating the domestic church, evangelizing the wor- world, <laughs> evangelizing the word, if I can say that, uh, and and just being the, the stewards and shepherds of our families, our communities, the world. So there's nothing that a woman is not given within the Catholic church that God himself did not give to us. God gave men and women different personality types, um, different strengths and weaknesses. And we all are different. You know, there can be men who are more caring and women who are more aggressive, but within those realms, we're still men and we're still women. And it is that those differences in our personalities, but still the that is, but still the that cohesiveness of being feminine or masculine that can really make us do some really wonderful and great things for our church. We can be soldiers, Saint Joan of Arc. We can be healers, Saint Hildegard. Um, we can be deeply prayerful, uh, like uh, Teresa of Avila, or uh, very submissive and and humble, like Therese of Lisieux. So. I think I'm a firm believer and I completely submit to the Catholic teachings on women because I am fully convinced that it is not a man, an ordinary man trying to take down women who came up with those rules. It was Jesus Christ himself and those acting in Jesus's name as the high priest of our, uh, the church, which is the mystical body of Christ. I hope that makes sense. If you have any questions or have, or have uh, any, any points of clarification or have any ideas or thoughts about this episode, I invite you to email me or message me if you go to thecatholicmama.com and uh, backslash contact. So thecatholicmama.com backslash contact. Uh, you can write a note in there and I'll see it and I'll either try to talk about it in the next episode or I'll send you a message back 
if I can. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Don't forget to hit subscribe so that you don't miss out on these episodes. Uh, I will put a link in the show notes to The World's First Love by Fulton Jean because I, th- I really, really think that everyone should read it. It was actually Katie Bogner who was on um, the podcast a couple of weeks ago, which I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, who recommended it to me. And as soon as I was done with that podcast, I uh, d- uh, went and ordered it and I've been devouring it ever since. It's a really, really powerful book and shows the beauty of womanhood in, within the Catholic Church because the church needs women. The church needs men because the church needs women. The church needs men and the church needs women. It's not an either or. It's not one is better than another. It is God's will. He created both for a reason. And in Fulton Sheen so far is what I can tell in this book is really explaining the beauty of womanhood and why Mary is the epitome of womanhood. So anyway, thanks for joining me again. Uh, oh, and one last thing. If you can leave a review, if you haven't already, it takes like 30 seconds and I would be eternally... Don't forget to head over to thecatholicmama.com to get your free copy of How to Talk to Your Kids About God. This handy little ebook will teach you how to broach the topic of God with your children or how to respond to your kids when they want to talk about God, as well as give you answers to seven of the trickiest questions about the faith that Christian parents face. You'll love the easy to understand grown up answers, the pared down but not talked down answers you can share with your kids plus recommended resources if you'd like to deepen your understanding of the topic. Get yours free at thecatholicmama.com. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.